This episode of the Durian Pod is brought to you by Hexclad, official cookware partner of TDP. And this episode of the Durian Pod, I went to like four or five different elementary schools. As soon as I started to make friends, I had to bounce. Art was my icebreaker. Being a Spider-Man fan your entire life, and then all of a sudden you get to see this black kid, yeah. just full screen, and the movie's dope. And his powers are cooler than Peter's. I got fired from Pizza Hut. Oh, it's a whole story. I don't, know, so <laughs> I don't want to say that on camera. But... <laughs> Cheers, y'all. Cheers. Cheers. Poo, hoo, he, hey, oh, hey, hey, hey. Let's go. Mm. We are celebrating Sober October with Suntory All Free. Nice, bubbly, non-alcoholic beverage. It's zero calories, and I think it's perfect to kind of be sober this month. Let's do it. I, yeah. And very enjoyable. I love it. Let's get started. Let's do this. What is up, everyone? My name is David. And I'm Jasper. And behind the camera, we have our wonderful Heidi. What's up? And welcome to another episode of the Durian Pod. This is the show where we highlight our friends who fought against the saddle standards, but still made it to the top. Today, we have a really cool guest. Yeah, I am really excited about this one just because I'm a nerd at heart. I know you are too. Same, same, yeah. We have here today a self-taught artist building up a resume of director, storyboard artist, and designer. He's worked on big name projects like Ultimate Spider-Man, Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts, Cyberpunk Edge Runners, Black Dynamite, and now, involved with Marvel Studios doing X-Men 97. He's giving back to his community, teaching and inspiring animators and artists. And if you've seen his art, it speaks for itself. But what I really love about it is that it's unapologetically him. Put our hands together. Welcome our guest today, Chase Conley. Hey. I like that intro. Hey, what up? Welcome. What up, bro? Nice to here, man. Dude, it's good to see you. Chilling with the homies. Exactly. Yeah, this is cool, man. Dude, yeah. how, how long has it been? It's been a while since I've seen you. Maybe about six or seven months. I think yeah. we had lunch briefly. Very briefly. Under yeah. duress. Under you duress. Know, typically. Over you know, sushi, right? always. Fighting deadlines. But yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you guys for, <laughs> Dude, the, thank for, you for, for the, being for the intro and the invite. So, so excited. Cool. And this beer is good. So broad. Shout sober. out Suntory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's solid. It's really solid. I think this is actually the perfect time. So every you've been to Roslyn before. Yes. And you know that we always like to start you off with the first dish, also known as the amuse. I think this is the perfect time to bring it out. So I'm going to step away. I'm going to bring it over while you sip some of that non-alcoholic beer, and we'll be right back. Here we go. Soft, a little bit of beautiful <clears throat> Raza olive oil. Mm, okay. Can I, can I steal you? Can I steal that? Yes, you can. <laughs> olive oil is good for you. <laughs> yes, it is. I'll do a spoonful a day. Sheesh. You want one? You want a full spoonful? I'll take a spoonful. Uh, right now? I'll okay. do it right now. All right. I haven't had any today. Give me, give me a spoonful. Oil. He wants yeah. olive oil. Not a problem. Here we go. It's good. It reduces inflammation, promotes healing. This one wow. made popping All like, that stuff. A spoonful of. Ooh, oh, you shit. spilling, bro. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Let me, <laughs> let me on, just two hand that. There you go. So got I'm going to get on it. the mic. All yeah. Right. Okay, precious. That's on point. Yeah. That's good. It's the good olive oil. Yeah, it's not bitter or anything. No, shout out, shout <laughs> out to Graza. It's a cold press. They don't do it uh, through no processing. Bite. And uh, yeah, I'll send you home with a bottle later. Okay. Yeah. I'll definitely use it. Hell yeah. So for your amuse and how we're going to start the podcast is going to be something that's always fresh, something that's very mm. vibrant. And today we've got a fresh tostado with bluefin tuna. Got otoro and chutoro cuts. We toss it in our house yuzu marmalade ponzu, a little bit of white truffle oil, yeah, some chives, too. and a ton of microgreens because I figured you're hungry. It's eight o'clock. Yeah, <laughs> I, can, I can definitely eat. Yeah. So yeah. let's go ahead and let's just dig in. Let's crunch into it. Right just enjoy the food. Pick let's it up. Go. Eat it however you like. But it is a tostado. I so I want to try to oh, man. get a little bit of extra support here from the fork. How do I eat this not I, ugly? I would just pick it up. Mmm. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Mm. Mm. Texture game is on point. Mm -hmm. Let me go ahead and try to. It is really Eat good. On the camera is like eating in front of a first date. Yeah. Mm. Don't go with that. Oh man. I'm so. Really, I love the greens. It's really fresh. Mm -hmm. Just don't judge me if there's food mm. everywhere. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I remember though the first time I met you we were at that sushi bar. Yeah. And pass over some sushi to you, and uh, I thought it was actually appropriate that our first course tonight was. Based Aww. off that story. So that, that is sentimental. It's so funny. Uh, it's, it's cool. I always think about that with um, with, uh, with fondness. Yes. Especially because I think the first time I met Jasper, I was shit-faced. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yes. we met at a whole other bar <laughs> mm -hmm. on another day. I was go. like, this guy is really cool. <laughs> we hung out. The next day, I didn't remember any of it. <laughs> but I saw Jasper again, and I was like, yo, 
this guy's really cool. I want to kick it with this guy. Again? And he was like, <laughs> he was like, yeah, you know we met yesterday, right? <laughs> he was like, nah, I don't remember that. <laughs> but it was true, though. And we've been friends ever since. That was like four or five, that was almost five years ago now. Almost five years, dude. It's crazy, bro. I do remember because I was taking some photos for a photo shoot. This is when I was like doing restaurant consulting. We had a mm. bunch of sushi sitting out. Mm. Remember the first night you guys came, it was like right at closing. You guys were asking if there was any food because you all were like That's kind true. of drunk. Yep. And that sounds the, about right. And the kitchen was closed. But I was like, hey, dude, have some of this. Like, mm. we're not going to eat all of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think we connected and then you showed up the next night. Yeah. And I think about how far uh, how far you've come because mm -hmm. now you're fully sober. And uh, no, no. Nah, nah. It's a testament to, the, to, the, to how good it is. You know what I'm saying? Hope you enjoyed that. I did, man. You, you see I'm still smacking. Thank you, Chef. It was oh. delicious. My pleasure. Chef Jasper. <laughs> Chef Jasper. <laughs> Let's rewind it and go back to your roots, where you came from, your upbringing, um, your parents. Tell, tell me about that. Uh, the way, like I said, I like to tell this is kind of around art milestones and stuff, right? My mom's, my so my mom's side of the family is all, they're all from Morgan to North Carolina, kind of spread out uh, uh, as well. But, you know, it's a small town. And when I was a little younger, like really young, you know, I was, I, I lived with my grandparents early on. So my mom was living in Texas. That's where she met my father. I was living with my grandparents at the time, back at back in Mor uh, Morganton, eight kids and my great aunts and uncles. And all of them built houses on that land right in the radius of that house. So it's like a village of my family, essentially. Um, you, you know, I'm talking about stone's throw. Like this is the, the, the my great grandmother's house, the big house. And then that building right there, that would be like my, my grandparents' house. Yeah. And then my aunt's house was right across in the front of that house. And then my uncle's house. So it was like his brothers and sisters were all around him as well. And they worked in furniture factories pretty much my whole life. Um, my great, my grandmother and my grandfather. So I was a latchkey kid. So I'd get to school, it'd be like 5.30, right? I'm just in, in school chilling, dolo with like, or like there's four or five kids that had to come to school really early. Well, eventually I got to the age where I was like, I, they, they, they felt comfortable with me just coming home because the bus would essentially drop me off around all my family. It didn't matter if they were off or not because I got to walk past everybody's house to get to the crib. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like someone's home. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I hope so, yeah. Yeah, and then it's like, um, you know, your grandparents got that different type of uh, uh, fear that can strike in you. You know, you better not slip off, you know? And it's like, so I, I was too scared to go anywhere. You know what I mean? I wasn't going to wander anywhere. But the thing that I, I used to love is when my grandfather would go to, which is still there, it's clinic, uh, clinic drug, in Glen Alpine, North Carolina, another small city, small town adjacent to Morganton, he would go and get his diabetes medication. And so, you know, you know, back then, comics were sold everywhere. You know, you would find comics on spinner racks. You know, you go to the gas station, the grocery store, doesn't matter. Comics are going to be there. And you're going to have trading cards, like the little Fleer Ultra cards. You're going to have those in the, in the, in the line. Those. You know what I'm saying? I have like a book of like, Card you put in the slots. Exactly, the man. I got the pages still somewhere. You trade after this. Um, I'd have to find them in my probably my mom's basement. He's like, no, I'm good. Probably, the humidity has probably killed them shits. Yeah, so comics were bought on spinner racks. So every time my grandfather would go into town, because you had to drive into town, he'd buy me a comic. I drew every single drawing in that comic. In school, I just always drew, but it, it was just a natural thing for me. There was just creative people in my family, you know, but these are really hardworking work the fields and that kind of stuff. My grandfather had me in the fields. You know, we had crops, all that kind of stuff. You know, I was using tillers and cutting huge lots of land on riding mowers, you know, way too young. In my, you know, there's like the room that you don't go in for company. And, uh, you know, any black family can identify with that. Like, you, you don't go in that room. You don't have no business in there. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, it's pristine all the time. It's got shag carpet. It's like, who has anybody been in here since the 70s though? You know, like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so anyway, in, in the China cabinet, there was a, what I couldn't, I could only imagine it felt like to my young mind, like a treasure map looking type of thing. It was like a thick rolled up piece of paper, thick. But you know, in school, you're used to this like newsprint stuff. So about a year goes by, I'm looking at this thing. I'm shook. I ain't even trying to, I feel like if, I go in there, she gonna wreck it. She gonna know that I was breathing in that room. You know what I mean? So I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not gonna touch it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Anyway, I unrolled it and it's like this 
really cool to my mind at that time, an immaculate pastel drawing of an old man. And it was signed Daniel. That's how I learned my father's name. Because I never mm. met my father. Oh, I see. Okay. Right? So, oh. yeah, my father's Ethiopian. Mm-hmm. And so he was here on a medical visa working for the UN at a hospital mm-hmm. in Texas. I was just like, that. that the, the significance of that is not like an origin story, right? Like, so I grew up with, I grew up with a lot of love around me. You know, I grew up with smiling faces staring down at me. My grandfather was the male figure in my life, you know, and then I had his brother, my Uncle Harry, who's passed, uh, my Uncle Amberst, who was my, his sister's wife, and my Aunt Jeanette, you know, they were all right next to me, you know what I mean? So and these are older gentlemen, and so I never lacked for love of any kind of male figure or anything like that, but it was still, it was cool to know that, like, you know, when you're learning in school, your little boys are supposed to be like their dads. Yeah. So to me, I thought it was just, oh, dope, my dad draws, you know. But I remember that moment when I came, when my grandmother came home. And I, at this point, I'm like, the cat's out of the bag. I got to know who Daniel is. Right. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's signed that it's dated the year before I was born, which is dated in 85. So she's cooking dinner. And I'm like, this is a good time to ask her because she can't beat my ass. And she got... <laughs> she, <laughs> And she got her hands in the pots, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. I was, I'm like, yo, I got it, I got it, I got the time. She could have thrown the pot at she you. She could have, but you know what, dog? No. I was like, you know, I'm going to take this chance. And I was like, Grandma, who's Daniel? And she just stopped. And she thought about it for a second, and she was like, that's your father. And interesting enough, I was like, so did he draw this? And she was like, yeah, he drew this. He left that here when he came to visit. And then I never talked about that again for 16 years. Mm. Oh, wow. I just never talked about it again. You know, I, 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 it wasn't any particular reason. But, you know, kids understand a lot. I just was like, he's not in my life. That drawing, though, introduced the concept of, like, high art to me. Because mm-hmm. you you see little kids drawing stuff in school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, you're drawing this, that, and the third. I was like, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I know what real art is. And it just elevated my understanding and then what I reached for. And then next thing I know, everybody in class starting in first, second grade wanted me to draw all their stuff for homework. Mm. But I didn't really mind because I wanted to do it, you know? So I was like, and so it, it, was, it was cool. So kind of fast forward in. So, you know, at that point, I'm still reading comics, you know? I'm into X-Men is my favorite, but, you know, mm. I'm watching Saturday morning cartoons, you know, all that stuff that came up in the early 90s. Ninja Turtles was my bag, you know? Sure. Like, I, sure. my, my mom had a scrapbook. It was just drawings that I had from way too young to remember. But it was nothing but Ninja Turtles on, like, newsprint paper. I was really into Ninja Turtles, yo. So I always knew I wanted to work in comics because that's just what I loved, you know? Like, yeah. I loved I loved the stories I read. Yeah. And it was way more mature than, I think, my family, my grandparents knew. When they were yeah. buying me stuff, you were just, just buying me stuff. Because these it's, stories are... It's cartoons. Yeah, these, yeah, but these stories are intense. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? No, like, like, people even, die. Even to this day, you read them again, you watch it again, you're like, damn. Yeah, you know, I remember watching, like... You get that till, till later, but... I, yeah. I remember seeing somebody, like, somebody took Shatterstar's swords, and then you just heard this hum, and then the dude's arms just blew off on the panel. <laughs> I was like, yo, this is <laughs> insane. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, this is crazy, but... Yeah, so I'm still doing that. Yeah. At that time, and then uh, I ended up moving with my mom. When I went to Jacksonville, I went to Hendricks Avenue Elementary, which was essentially like the school of the arts for elementary. Mm -hmm. And it was right down the street from where I eventually went to middle school. Wait, uh, real quick. How did you get into the magnet school there? Was it because your mom kind of put you there? My mom put me in there. Okay, she put you in there. So she she was very supportive in the beginning. Always. Like, that's interesting. It's good that you bring that up. My mom is always, even my family, they've always been super supportive of what my career choice was and what what my interests were. You know, like, I I played sports and all that stuff, too. But if I ever needed anything like a desk, like I I had a, a desk with an incline when I was really young, paper, art supplies, you know, that stuff is cheap. Yeah. You know, like buy computer paper and all I really needed was a pencil. I wasn't really even using any other kind of medium. And to them, it was like, oh, you buy a desk and, you know, some st- uh, some paper and some pencils right. and a few comics. And he's quiet. He's out of trouble. He's not bothering anybody. <laughs> you know, I know, you know, I know you said they were supportive of you. And, you, you know, at the time your vibe was just drawing art. Yeah. Was there any moment in time where they're like, Chase, you can't make money off drawing? Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to be? Because that, that's always a conversation. Like, you know, you have your kids. Like, 
well, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. And then you, you always say a realistic thing. And then you say, kids say astronauts. But like how realistic can that be? I mean, it is realistic, but there was never that conversation with you as you're young or maybe a young, young adult, teenager, mm. any of that? No, not at all. They not just even, said- Not even remotely. Wow. I think it maybe had a lot to do with the fact that I come from such a small town. It's got massive gravity because mm-hmm. a lot of people just don't leave. You know, mm. a lot of people just stay there, you know, um, and do the stuff that you do in small towns, you know? So no, and then my mom also, she moved out early. She didn't want me to be raised in Morganton. She didn't want to live in Morganton. Not that there's anything against it per se, but that's, she just didn't see that for herself, you know, yeah. and I'm glad, you know? So yeah, I've always had support. And that's why she went so far as to set me up in a way that she thought was best. So I put me in magnet schools and one is for the education, right? So she really wanted me to have like really good education. You know, my mom was always on my ass about my grades. I enjoyed school. You know, I thought school was cool. The the one thing that I didn't like is the fact that I went to like four or five different elementary schools. Mm. So art was my icebreaker. You know, like anytime I would go somewhere, I was in a new spot. I never, mm. as soon as I started to make friends, I had to bounce. You oh, know, so oh, like, shit. yeah. Yeah, so I, 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 what I would do is like, okay, I go to, to class the next day. I don't know anybody anyway. I'm not doing it for that reason. But I'm in class and then I'm just drawing and somebody's like, yo, is that Sub-Zero? Or something like that. You know, like, what is that? Yo, you see this kid right here? And then it's like, next thing you know, everybody knew me. Yeah. Oh, that's so every, cool. everywhere I went, everybody knew me. My art was always the, the icebreaker for, for anything. No, I was going to say, that's very different from my story because mm-hmm. I, I used to love drawing. Mm-hmm. Actually, I don't know if I ever told you. I actually did, went to art school as like a kid. No, but yeah. wait, you did tell me. Your sister is super talented too. Oh yeah, she's she's way more talented. Mm-hmm. But I'm talking to like, I was drawing stuff, but I would be made fun of instead. Really? <laughs> yeah, because my shit wasn't good. It must good. have been really bad. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was really bad. <laughs> I was going to really say that. Bad. That's a different yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my sister got like, all the creative talent for sure. But I've always loved it. So that's that's really cool though. Like so that became your talking point and why everyone would be like, yes. yo, Chase, draw me. Yeah. That was for <laughs> like me, that French was girls, like, like French girls. that was the thing. And uh what it wasn't even drawing me at first, it was like drawing the stuff that was popular at the time. Yeah. You know, like whatever that was, um, whatever kids were watching, you know, stuff like that. But I really just drew for myself too, though. You know, like I didn't draw too many other things. And you know, it was always like it was cool because that that, that was somebody's identity that I, that I stole. In the school, you know, like this person, that was a drawing person, but I came in and I smashed on him. Damn. And then, then, then I had beef, you know, like, <laughs> like, yo, like drawing beef, drawing I've beef. I've never heard bro. of it before. Drawing beef. Wow. If you still, yeah. if he's watching. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I don't know. Like, there's a couple cats that um, I don't think any of them. We all ended up being cool, you know. That's nice. Yeah, it was, okay. it was a cool thing. I could, but people would egg it on, like, oh, you're not better than such and such. And yeah. then I'm like, yo, and I, I'd be like, yo, I'm just sketching though. You know, just doing your I'm thing. just doodling. Yeah, like, yeah. let me show you for real. And then I had to like really go in real quick. I like that. But yeah, so I went to comic book conventions. And so I was able to meet a lot of talent that I'm I work with today. Cause so just so happened in um Charlotte, that here that Heroes Con, Heroes Convention, that's like every comic book artist's favorite convention in the whole country. Cause they just like coming to kick it and it, Charlotte's like Charlotte's laid back. Um, so I got to see some of the best talent in the world starting at 14 all the way through essentially 19. Um, and during that time period, around 15, 16, I met like um, somebody who I consider my brother, uh, Karen Grant. I met uh, Sanford Green. Sanford Green um, is amazing. Um, LaShawn Thomas, who I met. You know, Ed McGinnis. I, I met a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of people. The Chris Copeland, Justin Copeland. A lot of these people that I work with today um, Brian Stelfreeze, you know, like legends in the game, uh, anybody you can think of. But uh, during that time, you know, it was cool because I, I bumped into LaShawn and LaShawn was was uh, the anime guy. And so he was a board artist that was just there at the convention, but he was in a virtual studio with, uh, called Artzilla at the time. And, you know, he had been giving me game about like, I was like, man, you know, I want to work in comics, but comics doesn't pay that great. Uh, I enjoy it though, you know, but I would love to be able to diversify and he was like, yo, you got all the makings of a board artist. And here's the, and the thing about being a board artist is this is the trajectory. And he told me the trajectory to be, he was like, what you want to do? You want to make your own stuff. You want to be a showrunner, right? So hey, just, you know, just so no, uh, of course. Our, our viewers know, kind of follow you is like, what, what, 
Uh, just real quick, board yeah. artist. A storyboard artist. Yeah. yeah so a storyboard artist, um, you know, essentially an animation um, or in anything really, essentially, you're more or less like a cinematographer, but you draw it instead of move a camera, right? You do the rough bones of everything. Um, now there's varying degrees of that, right? So you have like some boards that are really loose that are just like shot setups and stuff that I do because I work in action animation, our boards are almost like keyframe animation. You know, I'm doing like a rough, real rough version of the episode, lighting and all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's labor intensive. I remember when you first described it to me because I knew nothing about this, this yeah. before my sister even started, like she was just dabbling in storyboarding, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, literally it's you drawing the exact screenshot mm -hmm. of what that's going to look like on the film yep. or on the animation. Yeah. And then it's like burst between every couple minutes when there's a significant change between a different character, yep. If it's a different scene, different like facial expression, yep. and that way whoever's animating or whoever's, you know, filming the shot, yeah. knows exactly what to do. That's exactly it. Yeah. It's, it's a roadmap, you know. Yeah. So I'll take a little bit if you. Yeah, got, lots you of, yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, let me tell you. you, you know, open up this it's, pretty, it's nice, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's good. I like it. Look at that. It's it's refreshing. It's really refreshing. We'll just go, really go down the line. Of course, Chase. Pass me your cup. We got to pour you. Yeah, thank you. How did like living in South Korea? For a year, how, how did that affect or influence, you know, maybe the way you operate uh, in your craft or how you kind of did, did or did it at all, you know? Uh, and, and it, significantly, actually, like around that time, I was feeling like the superhero fatigue uh, in a sense because like how I didn't know. Yeah, well, <laughs> interesting, right? Like, <laughs> as I'm working on X Men, but you know, it's, uh, bringing well, something well, different back. It's a different world. <laughs> By that time, you know, I was tired of. You know, I've been consuming superhero stuff out my whole life, but never in the sense of like, this is what I wanted to do. It was more like, this is the job I want because I know it'll pay the most in comics. If I'm working in comics as a professional, I get paid the most drawing superhero books, mm. right? At least that's what I thought at that time. You know, there's other ways to go about that. But if you own creator owned IP that, tends, that pops off or something. But yeah, that's what I wanted to do. So when I got there, though, everybody was reading manhwa. And then, and and then it was, and the the acceptance from people when I told them what I did was just a different thing. There wasn't this, this because people in Asia consume comics all the way up to any age, mm -hmm. and there's comics for any age, any mm -hmm. any group, anything you want to make a comic about cooking doesn't matter. There's the story for you, and there's a stigma on that stuff here in the sense of like it's for kids, or it's like they're cartoons, you know, and it's like that's not what that's not the stuff that I explored, you know, I I. I studied filmmakers. I wanted to make, mm. ma like, I'm an auteur. I wanted to make dope cinema. Uh, Satoshi Kon to, to Otomo, you know, um, you know, Kawajiri is one of one of the influences I wear on my sleeve. You know, um, Mamoru Oshii, which is like Ghost in the Shell, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to make stuff like that. And then, and when I got there, it just, it, I don't know, some, it's, I think something, it was freeing as well. Mm. Because there was no, there, in Charlotte, they didn't have, there was nobody that, that I rocked with on that level with that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I developed like a sense of like a duality. Like I played sports my whole life. Yeah. When I went outside, I used to hoop. Or I used to play football. Like, you know, but when I went inside, I did this. I kept my mm -hmm. heart to myself. People knew I drew. Because that's what right. I'd be doing in school all day, you know? And I was always the guy that drew, you know? Yeah. yeah. You were yeah. the 6'4 linebacker yeah. who also knew how to draw every Marvel <laughs> superhero, <laughs> you know? You know? Like, yeah. yeah. You know, maybe not a linebacker. <laughs> I don't I like love, kind sorry, of quarterback, contact, quarterback. You know? corner. <laughs> yeah, I love that, like, experiences, like, really dramatic ones like that. Like, you literally moved to a different country mm. um, where you didn't have any ties to. And you said, like, fuck it, right? And, like, you took yeah. that and it influenced how you operate, your art, your craft. It always just amazes me how those things really influence like how people operate now, you know? Yeah, um, it was amazing. It was an amazing yeah, experience. Yeah. As as someone that is coming back and now you kind of have to restart in uh, a setting where you don't really maybe have ties there as, mm -hmm. as close as you do on the east side. But then what was the landscape there? Like um, getting into the scene of like, oh, let me get into comics. Let me get into art drawing um, in the industry in LA. Sure. Because I think LA... Being entertainment heavy, it's it can be cutthroat. It's interesting because I come from the message board era, forums, um, right? Yeah, forums oh, and it. stuff. And so you know, AOL, you know, AIM, and all that kind of stuff. And 
all these people in, in deviant art before it was like, you know, just kind of pervy art. You know, uh, like yes, that was a crazy you thing. Yeah, um, I used to have one. It was terrible. <laughs> yeah. So like at that point, you know, you these are people that the, everybody that's our age, we're kind of into the same stuff. And you find each other, you're in all these different forms. We essentially grew up together. So I've I've been posting my artwork since I was 14. The same people that I work with now, we've known each other for 20 plus years from being online. Um, and then a lot of them made the jump to LA first before I before me. So a lot of them were like, yo, you'd be great for this. Like you should move move to LA. And as soon as I got here, everybody em embraced me, you know, and it was an interesting story as well with that because when I was overseas, LaShawn was working on working on Legend of Korra season one. And I was just looking through his animation stuff that he was cleaning up at the time. You know, it's all done on paper and stuff. And um, he took me to see his other desk, which was at Moi. Mm -hmm. And on this desk, I saw black characters. So he's like the only black ar artist in uh, animation in Korea, for sure. Mm. And then he's got black characters on his desk. I'm like, what is this? And he's like, yo, this is a black dynamite. I was like, the movie? They're making an animated series like about the movie? Mm. He was like, yo, you'd be perfect for this. I'm going to call Carl. Simultaneously, when that was happening, mm -hmm. Dave Johnson, legendary comic artist, amazing cover artist and stuff. Um, he lives here as well. I think he may maybe moved back to LA, but he was doing that job for Titmouse at the time as a character designer for Black Dynamite. They had they were getting they just got the pilot. They got greenlit. He 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 quit because he was like, "This is not my vibe." But I know somebody that would be perfect for this. And then another artist that was on that production was like, I heard Dave quit. I know of another person that'd be perfect for this. And then their line producer was like, I was fine. I found this dude online. It'd be perfect for this. This all happened in the same day. They oh. were all talking about me. And they found all your stuff through DeviantArt through and DeviantArt. through the forums? Wow. Yeah, and through the forums. Because I used to be on yeah. like LaShawn's forum and Artzilla, which is that group of artists mm. that I met at Heroes Convention. Uh, I've been posting my stuff and they had seen me grow up. And yeah. they seen my stuff from when I was in, you know, barely able to, to, you know, being able to sign a legal contract by myself, you know, that kind of stuff. And like I won a Marvel portfolio review at 19 and they were like, oh, we can definitely see you working for us. And then I was like, I don't want to do something else. And, yeah. and here you are. <laughs> yeah. Was, I was, so I was 24 at that time. And um, so that happened. And the owners of Titmouse, actually, Chris and Shannon Pranowski, they were like, and Carl Jones was the producer, was the showrunner, producer of Boon, of uh, Black Dynamite, excuse me, and he was on Boondocks as well. They were like, yo, we need you for this position. Can you come out to LA? I was like, nah, no savings. Like, my savings is gone. You know what I mean? They were like, how about you just come live with us until you get on your feet? Yeah. And so the owners of the studio believed in me enough to, like, move me into their house. And Wow. Yeah, and that's how I got to LA. And I, I stayed for, with them for two and a half weeks. And then I got an apartment across the street because I'm a very proud dude. And I slept on the floor for like two months with a blanket and a pillow until I That's crazy, got all man. my stuff over here. Uh, and, then, you know, I'm hearing this consistent trend of you being willing to kind of take that leap of faith constantly. I think that's yeah. actually one of the things that you and I really bonded over mm -hmm. is just what does that mentality shift cause or like what makes you kind of click in that way where you're like, I'm just going to go for it. Fuck it. Like, let's go. Yeah. Because it took me a while. And remember when we when we first met, I was still figuring shit out, right? Mm -hmm. But like you constantly were inspiring me because you were like, I'm gonna move. I'm gonna do this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump. I don't care. And like what what was kind of that thing that really motivated you to get to that point? I was really scared to go overseas. And when I did that, I was like, oh, me getting out of my comfort zone was the best thing that ever happened to me. Cause then now look, I'm in Los Angeles. This is all the direct result of my willingness to go do something. And it was a transcendent thing for me. So at that point, I was like, anytime I'm coming up against what I feel to be some level of resistance internally, I really evaluate it. And I'm like, maybe I need to make this move. They always say, if it's not comfortable, that means you're probably doing it right. You know, transcendence is a theme in my life. You know, like, you know, I'm not perfect, you know, but um, I feel as if I've grown a lot. It's important for me to make myself uncomfortable. You know, even yeah. even on a, on a more micro level, like when I get offered a job typically out here, let's say I get a job and I get an offer to stay at a studio or I get a chance to go to another studio. I'll go to the other studio mm -hmm. because I'll make more contacts. Right. Now I know a whole other group of producers. Right. A whole other, you know, hire, I mean, HR department, all that stuff now. So then my network is big. So anytime I have an opportunity to leave, I'll, I'll, I normally go. I've been around the way now, you know, so For it's sure. like there ain't so many more places to go now, you know, but <laughs> I just take whatever job I think I like, you know, yeah, but yeah. um, 
Yeah, man. So I, that that's important. You gotta you gotta make yourself uncomfortable. And I don't want to be weak. I don't want to live with regret. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people that just never left. So you push yourself. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think crazy. that's the most important thing to do. Well, I mean, your resume speaks for itself. Like, I, I know I introduced you and I, I hit all the the heavy projects, like mm. the ones that, you know, people would know. Mm -hmm. But you have so many medium-sized to smaller projects that are also dope that, you know, we don't have time to even mention because the list goes on and on and on. It's a long right? list. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure it is. <laughs> it's a long I, list. I meant to only hit the heavy hitters, you know. Yeah. You know, thinking about that journey, uh, you probably forgot about some of the projects you have done, but yeah. what point were you, you know, engaged in a project? You're like, okay, I know I can make a living off this. I know, I know I can do this. Yeah. Like this shit is real. This shit is real. <laughs> yeah. I've always believed in myself because I put the time in. Like right. I've been drawing my entire life. Right. And I've also been focused on a singular goal. Right. Of getting better. And I've always studied the right way. I took no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So I always knew given any opportunity, I was well-versed and well-rounded as an artist. I mean, mm -hmm. I can do whatever I want. This is, if I get put in a position, give me a shot, I'm going to kill it. Right. The only thing is, it's like, I don't like to, sometimes I don't like to sell myself, you know, mm -hmm. I just, that's just not my personality. Right. I've always tried to let my work speak for itself. You yeah. know? So maybe that's been a hurdle. Maybe not. You know, I think that, um, I'm fortunate in where I've ended up. I've had a good career that's continuing to grow in that capacity. So I'm not really concerned about that too much. Yeah. Tell me about the, like the moments you were like the most proud about, like the most proud. You're like, like, damn, I did that. Let's say, okay. When I was 19, we talked about that portfolio review. I had been taking my work to the conventions for years and I wasn't going looking for work per mm -hmm. se. I was going to show my work to people. Back then they had digital webbing, which is like the classified ads for comic books. It was a website. And so I was doing little stuff there, one-offs and stuff like that. But I was over the superhero thing. So I was like, you know, I'm not going to put pages together to go to this Marvel portfolio review. Joe Quesada was the editor-in-chief. This is back whenever they, he would still make his appearance and in, in, in review portfolios. Wow. Okay. And so I've known him since I was 19 as well. So my homeboy, Tashawn, kicking it with his family. His family was visiting. His aunt was in town. And they all knew I drew. And they were like, that comic book conventions this weekend. Are you going? I was like, I don't think I'm going this year. You know, I was being too cool and shit. <laughs> you know, I was like, 19. you've always been too cool. Chase. I was 19. You know, <laughs> um, I was like, I ain't going. I had my first apartment. I was like, man, I ain't, I'm not doing all that. You know, I got to go to work. I'm working at Books a Million. You know, the bookstore and stuff. And I'm like, I'm working on my portfolio. I'm gonna do some other stuff. And she was like, you better go to that convention. But I was like, it's 24 hours. I don't have nothing to take because I haven't done any pages. I got a bunch of sketches, but they want to see samples. Mm. I stayed up 24 straight hours and drew three Batman pages. Like mm -hmm. normally it takes a day to pencil one. I stayed up all night. I went to the convention. The, to get nominated, you had to go through the quick draw competition. Mm -hmm. I, I did that. It's like 20 minutes. They give you a, a topic, you draw it. I did that and then the, and I was like, man, I ain't about to, I ain't worried about this shit. So I took my portfolio and um I did the drawing. I left. The Dub Magazine car show was in the same convention center. I was like, I'm going over there. Yo. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> sick. Way, yeah, it's yeah. way iller. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we got the Fly S2000s yeah, and all that. You know, it's crazy her. stuff. The yeah. women look crazy over there at the time, too. You know, I was you know, I was 19. I was like, this is where I need to be. <laughs> um, I came back from, from over there. Yeah. And this guy is flagging me down. Chase. Chase. I'm like, looking. It's C.B. Sabolsky, who's head of Marvel Publishing now. Yeah. He's running down the escalator. Go to go to room such and such. You're you're. They've been looking for you. I get up there. I got sunglasses on because I'm bloodshot. I had a gold grill in with, with extended with your fangs. Batman pages? Yeah, with my Batman pages. Now my homie was trying to make me look important, so my boy uh, Ducey he came with me and he was like, "Yo, let me carry your book bag." <laughs> you know what I mean? So anytime it, it was cool. He was that's my that's my guy. Yeah. Now, yeah. I didn't do all that, but he, yeah. I was like, "Yo, let me see my stuff." And then. <laughs> <laughs> the homies was like, yo, look at this dude. Yo. <laughs> so I we we went we went over there and he was reviewing somebody's stuff. He was tearing them apart. I was up next. I went up on the stage. He just looked at my stuff in, in silence for 10 mm -hmm. minutes. Were you sweating? No. I was too cool for that. I had my I had my shades on. Like I said, I had a gold grill in with extended fangs. <laughs> and he just hung out with a bunch of, a bunch of import models. Yeah, so I was, like, yeah, I, was, I was chilling. Yeah. Yeah. I was chilling. So yeah. I took my shades off and I was like, yo, I just want to let you know, Joe, um, my eyes are bloodshot because I stayed up all night to do this stuff. And he was just like, look, and he didn't say anything. And he was like, yo, I, I have no notes for you. I love these pages. He was saying, he was like, 
not only that, I want to applaud this young man because he was the only person that didn't harass me in my hotel last night to try to preemptively show me mm. their stuff. I can see you working for Marvel today. We're going to get you a sample script. Oh, wow. Dope. And so then that's how I got my first gig because all the small publishers ran up to me after that. Mm. And so I decided to go with one of them um, instead because I liked the story that it was The Dresden Files, which mm. is like a book series by Jim Butcher. It was like a sci-fi show back in the 90s. My page rate was ass, but... I was like, I got consistent work finally. Mm. I can make a living doing this. How bad are we talking about, though? Oh, man, page we're rate. talking about um, 125 a page. Is that? I don't, and and you don't, so you don't, don't get royalties and stuff, anything. I mean, right? you're not getting nothing. You're yeah. just getting a, a $125 a page. And that's what, what, what after, is the equivalent I mean, before taxes. of that today? I mean, like with inflation and stuff I mean, like I was that? Because yeah. like, I don't know what that means to me. I'm like, 125 that sounds kind of good. Nah, you, nah. It's not good. It's like, not good because you have to think about the number of hours it takes, yeah, it takes to draw an entire yeah, so comic page. To pencil and ink a comic page, I was still I was only getting one twenty five. Yeah. So it took me about ten to twelve hours to do that. So then after uh, that, you, you're essentially making after taxes. I was probably making about you know eighty dollars, ninety dollars a day or something like that. Yeah, that's it, not that. It good. wasn't that great for the time put in because you can't do anything else. You right. can't. You can't like take side work at the same time, you know? It's still though, it was like, I was so happy. I was ecstatic to just have contract work. I signed a, a deal for a few years. Didn't I didn't end up finishing out that deal. I ended up leaving. And then the next thing I did was when I got the Black Dynamite job, when I was like, oh, the entertainment pays way more. Working in animation, animation. Is, was way different. And um, that was a big deal for me. And I had never seen more black artists in one building either because of the nature of the show. That that kind of launched it, right? Like animation, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I, w I got into it. I was already prepared for trying to transition into being a storyboard artist. I was going to take this guy, Jay Oliva, as the homie, industry veteran. You know, he's worked on a whole bunch of stuff, a lot of movies and animation as well. I was going to take his storyboard class, but I got in the door doing design. Right after that, though, I moved to the next job, and I was able to wear multiple hats and um, started directing right after that. I think... That is a good segue because I, I I know animation is a large part of your your uh, your your being your, yeah. your artistic craft. Are you hungry though? I think we should get to the next course. Let's do we're that. We're trying to feed you. That's the main yeah. goal today. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, that was, Chef, what we got? Oh, absolutely. So your next thing, and I think this is a perfect segue, is the favorite dish or our main course that we serve over at Roslyn right now. Got something special because I know you're still doing that pesca thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I can't wait to bring it to you. So give me a couple minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and fire that up for you, nice, hot, and fresh, and we'll be right back. Ah. Cheers. All right, let's go. Mm. <laughs> That's a big ass oyster. Yeah, oyster. Oh, yeah. No, it's just ah, up. Sorry. Damn. You sure just offer is no alcohol? Yeah. <laughs> Why you feel it? Well, I know that they, was a they call scallop. it the, they call it the placebo effect because uh, you know it tastes like beer, but it's not. So, mm. so Chase, this mm. one is their main dish, and this has been like a flagship since almost a year ago mm -hmm. uh, when we did series six, but you got an absolutely stunning Hokkaido scallop from Lux Seafood. We hard char it. So it's got a beautiful crisp and a crust on it. We let the heat radiate through the bottom is our cilantro chimichurri that you've had before. Sichuan peppercorn, garlic that's been pickled. You got fresh scallions on there, some little chili there as well. So Ooh. what I'd recommend is, uh, you know, go ahead and cut through it. It should be perfectly cooked through, put a little bit or a lot of sauce, however much you want. A lot of sauce. You already know. <laughs> Who am I kidding? A Chase, lot of Chase knows the food. Mm -hmm. He knows the food. So let's do this. Heidi, I hope you're eating as well. Mm -hmm. Making sure. And then we finish oh, I thought it. you were eating. I thought that's why you made that sound. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we finish it with a little bit of fur furikake today. So. Yeah. Oh, oh, man. This I is good. A yeah, I think, I think people need to see this. Just, just look at that. We love scallops here. Mm. I love how a lot of your dishes have a lot of that punchy flavor. You know, we Thanks. that time we went to Girl and the Goat that time. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, that was my very first time experiencing that. But it's cool that you've adopted unique and punchy flavors. And each one of your dishes tastes different. Yeah. But they all have like this nice intensity to them, you know. Not to the point that it's not that you can't enjoy it. But it's a pleasurable experience. You know what I mean? It's, yep. it's, it's the right kind of intense. Like, this is amazing. I agree. Oh, yeah, thank you, different man. different levels. Yeah. Thank you, man. That yeah. means a lot. How far we've come, right? I mean, <laughs> it's cool to see the evolution for sure. Oh, likewise. Yeah, extremely likewise, proud, man. It's cool. Thank you, man. So I've heard you've met P. 
Peter Ramsey. If you don't know who Peter Ramsey is, he is the director of the first Spider-Man into the uh, Spider-Verse. And that movie popped off. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. It was um, culture changing. And, it, you know, now it's the second one. That's how successful it was. You know, thinking about him, mm -hmm. tell us what it means to you for someone like that to just absolutely kill it. Because I think he really did. It's amazing. Like, you know, I got a chance to meet him. Brad Seacrest was working on uh, How to Train Your Dragon 2. And I went to go meet him for lunch at DreamWorks. And he was like, yo, I got this thing called Kipo. I'm going to show you. He showed me the comic. He's like, I'm going to sell this to DreamWorks. I'm going to make a series. When I get this greenlit, I'm going to make you a director. He ended up, uh, he was like, yo, come over here. I want you to come sit down. And he was like, this is Peter Ramsey. But it was like head of story, head of story, head of story of all these different movies. He just introduced me to all these people. The significance of that is the fact that, you know, Peter Ramsey's been around since live action stuff in the 90s. Yep. His first animated project was Shrek 3 or something like that. They were His friend was the director of that movie, was always trying to get him to come to animation. And he was like, nah, I'm cool in live action. Not only is his story amazing, Into the Spider-Verse is the first, he's the first black director to win Best Picture for animated feature. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a huge thing too, because you've never really seen animation on that type of spotlight. Like mm -hmm. everyone was saying how Into the Spider-Verse was game changing in terms of its style. Mm -hmm. And I remember that when you and I were talking about this, like the introduction of a African-American or black mm -hmm. main character, Miles Morales mm -hmm. was huge. And you had a huge pivotal point in, mm -hmm. in designing that too. Yeah. Well, not for the movie, but yeah. in the publishing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like they were working on Spider-Man upstairs. And Peter Ramsey would be in there. And then uh, Karen Tolliver, who's now head of Netflix animation, she put me, my boy Tyree Delahaye, on a panel. Tyree's directing a feature at Sony right now. And Matthew Cherry, who won the Oscar for Hair Love uh, for Best Animated Short, which is now Young Love, uh, which is just came out. Y'all got to watch that on HBO. Just came out this month, this past month, um, airing right now. with starring Issa Rae and Kid Cudi and stuff. He was there. They were accept. They were doing their like their Oscar ceremony thing in in studio there. And Peter Ramsey and they were. She was like, "Well, you want to be on the panel with them?" I was like, "Sure." So we. I talked. I was on a on stage with all of them. Oh, shit. and it was like generational. <laughs> yeah. So it was like I was the youngest. Then yeah. it was like Tyree. Then it was or Matt. And then it was Tyree. And then it was Peter Ramsey. And we all just talked about our experiences being black in animation. Yeah. Which that was really dope. So that that was the year we met. And so that was cool to be able to share that stage with such a legend. And, you know, he just directed Ahsoka, which he moved back into live action. Yeah. He, was, mm -hmm. he had an episode four or something like that. So that was a big thing. But, yeah, as far as my inclusion in Miles, they reached out to me because I was a designer that worked in animation and stuff. And I worked on a lot of black shows. And they were like, yo, we love your style. Would you like to take our hand, a hand at redesigning Miles for the 10th anniversary of mm -hmm. the comics? And it's now it's gonna be in the video game that comes out in two weeks. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, fire. I know um, it's so cool, dude. I, I kind of I kind of want to uh, rewind fire. rewind a little bit and yeah. like how influ influential was that? Just because like when that movie got released, it didn't get that much hype. Mm. Nor neither did the character, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, there is character change. Like, mm -hmm. wait, I always knew a Spider Man as Peter Parker. You know, mm -hmm. he's, he's you know he's. Caucasian, he's white, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you introduce this black character. You know, there's this thing about like people getting upset about like what they know getting changed. Mm -hmm. But remember that. when it gets launched, they kill it. Mm -hmm. So he's literally paving the way. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how how many other directors or storyboard artists there are that can do that, but he did it in a mainstream manner that mm -hmm. I, I think is super special. So yeah, I, I mean, it's just about making a good story. Like, and there were so many cultural nuances in that first movie. They that, literally made Jordan 1s yes, based off that character's Yeah, I mean, shoe. it's crazy, you know? So, like, they they injected just the right amount of, like, this, like, from when the relationship with his parents. I mean, everybody can, can, can relate to, you know, his relationship with his mother and his father. And I think that it was important to highlight that. And as far as Miles... I always go back to like the Stan Lee thing where he was like, you know, we designed Spider-Man so you don't know who's under the suit. He could be black, he could be white, doesn't yeah. matter. Because he's in every every man in his character. You know, that's what makes Spider-Man so cool. He's my favorite superhero. If I had to choose a superhero, Spider-Man is my favorite just because of that reason. He could be anyone. And that's what why it's, so, it's such an easy transition, I think, with Miles. 
and you know, there's a lot of different spider characters. You know, they've done a lot of different things with like the clones and all that stuff as well. But it hits different when you see yourself in a character. Mm. That's why people love it so much. Miles comes from the Ultimate Universe, and they 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 dissolve that. But he was such a dope character. They found a way to like bring him in through yeah. st- through like they redid Secret Wars in 2004, yeah. which is a cool story from the 80s. I mean, they teased it. It was supposed to be Donald Glover for a little bit. Remember for a little that? bit, for yeah. For a little bit, but yeah. then I'm glad they did it this way. Well, it was cool that he's Prowler, you know, that, yeah, he's, that, yeah, that, yeah. that he ends up being like Uncle Aaron or whatever, you know, so. Yeah, but it was cool. It's, it's just important to see yourself in that capacity. And I remember grown men crying because you don't get a chance to see that. You know, they've been, imagine being a Spider-Man fan for, he's been around since what, the 50s or something like that. Or, um, being a Spider-Man fan your entire life and then all of a sudden you get to see this black kid yeah. just full screen and the movie's dope. And his powers are cooler than Peter's. He's got more of them. Not gonna lie, I agree. Yeah, I he's, mean, he's, he's got more of them. He didn't need the little extractor thing either. That helps. Yeah, right? he's got like uh, he can turn invisible. He can cloak yeah. electricity. Yeah. He can shock stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like it's cool. His his ability is cool. You know, so you know, representation matters in that capacity. Absolutely. I'm I am kind of against like, just on a personal level, race swapping certain things because I like canon to be canon, and I've always kind of had somewhat of an issue. I think Miles is one of the rare exceptions to this rule for me, but I don't like when they just give us black versions of other flagship just characters. Just to do it. Give us new black characters. Yep. Give us new Latino characters. Give mm-hmm. us new Asian characters. Mm-hmm. Like, don't recycle things because it'll sell. Right. You know, take that time to cultivate the audience. Like, you know, it's easy to do whenever you, you've got the brand recognition of something that's been around for 70 years, right? It's going to sell. But, you know, take the time, invest in, in good stories. And then if you write good stories, people will... Be drawn to it. You know? It reminds me of a, unfortunately, a somewhat a drunken conversation that I had. It mm-hmm. was someone was almost, almost like an argument with a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Cause we were, we were talking about 007 mm-hmm. and the fact that, you know, Idris is, might be doing it. And mm-hmm. then they had the, uh, the female actress that was in the last movie as well. Mm-hmm. And it's like, why not just replace him? Mm-hmm. Give a brand new, like call it 008 or something mm-hmm. like that. Like just give them a brand new story. Cause that arc is such a different story than the playboy. I agree. White guy, yeah. Like, you know? And they, I, I've I've heard the arguments with that too, like where it's like, oh, James Bond is the title, it's a code name, you know, because there could be many 007s. I get yes. that because you know when one is yeah. gone, it's not like, you know, there's only so many numbers, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like yeah, there can be another 007, but let James Bond be James Bond. Like mm-hmm. just do somebody else. Yeah, I don't want Idris Elba to be James Bond because I like them as Luther. You know, he, he's great as Luther. Why do they have to be James Bond? They could be double O because well, double O eight was in Goldeneye. Yeah, but there could be another double O eight though. You know? Yeah, I remember Goldeneye. Yeah, that man, be, I missed that game. Yeah. That was yeah. that was transcendent game. Yeah, right especially the pause menu and mm-hmm. that really really intense beat that they had going on. I just remember dying a lot. <laughs> in the game, in the game. I odd job with the proximity mines. Yeah, yeah. You just be walking and blow up. Yeah, that was me. I'm across the board though. So to kind of transition off uh, Peter Ramsey, mm-hmm. um, you know, his influence, I hope you know that you are part of that same boat that's pushing that envelope to for younger artists that are mm-hmm. like, hey, who do I look up to? You know, representation. And, and now sure. you're part of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look up, you know, to those people, but now you're it. Yeah. I Especially with like big name projects. Yeah. It, it's to me, I, I've always kind of wanted to not, I wanted to show one, I, I was just doing what I loved. But I'm I'm self aware in the sense that now, I think it's important to show young black people that you don't have to just do the same thing. You don't have to be a rapper. Mm. You don't got to hoop. You don't have to play football. From sports, though, I've, I've always had that competitive edge as well, where I just refuse to lose. So you know, I've got the tenacity to just keep pushing to right. to try to you know to be an example. But you know, you become. You before you know it, you become an elder statesman. I'm 37. When we were young, right? But yeah. at the same time, I got kids that are now that are my students that are 20, 20 years old, etc. They've been looking up to me. I don't know why, you know. But they've been oh. look, they've been following my work for 10 years already. Yeah. And it's like that's bugged out. Like you know, it's a weird thing to think about. So, um, and 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 also too, you know, there's a the main component about that 
with black people specifically, you know, it's unfortunate. We're all, everybody else gets to be individuals, but anything I do reflects on my whole race. I'm staking my talent against that too. You know, like if I, I know for a fact though, if there's certain, there's certain things that I've said that I feel like if I did not have this skill cultivated, that it would be detrimental to me. Mm. But because I, I've cultivated my skills, another reason to keep my skills sharp. Damn, my bad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> nah, I mean, it's just real, you know? I, I, I feel that way. You know, I feel it when I, I just feel it. You know, it's a sixth sense. You know, I'm like, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this person really rocks with me like that. Yeah. Because they they haven't really experienced anybody that's from where I'm from, or grew up and seen the things that I've seen growing up. Uh, like most, you know, you know, we all got our own unique experiences. When I was on that panel, it was interesting seeing how Peter Ramsey was the oldest one. Then it was like Matt and Tyree, and then me. And each one of us experienced race being a hurdle a little less mm. in our stories. Mm -hmm. Love that. You That's know good. what I mean? So um, that was that was a big thing too, you know, so. Yeah, and I think yeah. it's incredible too when you talk about how our generation's very blessed mm -hmm. where these racial barriers seem to get kind of broken down a little bit by people before us. Mm -hmm. You know, we just had a couple of people on the show recently and, uh, you know, Jing from Fly By Jing, she's, she's the one who created like the Sichuan chili crisp, right? Mm -hmm. That chili oil that's everywhere. The I love that stuff. Right. It's the proliferation of chili oil. And for us as Asian Americans, it's like back in the day, mm -hmm. I was made fun of if I had chili on my on my food that my parents made me. Which you is know? which is crazy. Right. And now it's cool. That is yeah. like the most main I have some of that stuff. Yeah. I found it online from from a YouTuber. I yeah. Was like, this is great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it's so fun because like you're talking about this kind of almost like a proliferation, right? Mm -hmm. From Peter Ramsey to to you, mm -hmm. and it's gotten easier. Same thing for us. I think now as Asian Americans, we're finally seeing that. Mm -hmm. I think it's so cool that for African Americans mm -hmm. or the black community, that really, I think, kick-started that conversation. Because yeah. I don't think if that happened, we wouldn't have had that conversation either. Because we're I a agree. lot, I would say we're a little pa more passive. And there's a lot of that that could be, we could be indoctrinated into thinking like, you know, there's something that you always hear when you're young and you're black. You got to work two times harder. Mm -hmm. that, that could kind of kill your quality of life. If you're always thinking you got to work two times harder than everybody else, you know, yeah. because because of X, Y, Z. But it is like a safe bet to make sure that you secure yourself, you know. But um, everybody I know that's black, they function under that mentality. Each one of us is a representation of every one of us, you know, yeah. regardless if people want to say that or not. You know, um, when I when I first came into the studio system, you know, I was real rough around the edges, you know, like that's just you know, where I, where, I, where I come from, I just had, wasn't used to kind of the corporate environment. I wasn't wilding out or nothing like that. But, you know, it, it was different, you know what I mean? And yeah, I really had to to try to understand how to navigate that in a, in a, in a way that didn't make me feel like I was compromising my integrity. You know? I, I hope you know, I mean, I know you're humble about it, but to be honest, man, like, I hope you know you are putting out like that, that hope for, for kids that um, want to do that, but maybe they don't see themselves represented, you know, in that manner. You sure. Know? So like when they see Miles in, in the second movie, they're like, mm -hmm. oh, that's dope. That's very surface level, right? But then when they look deeper and they see that, oh, like this black character is created by black people. Mm -hmm. This is dope. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have to do X, Y, and Z like you mentioned earlier. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can I can go this path. And, and you're, you're you're shedding that light. You're paving that that path, and let's know that, man. Like I know you're trying to be humble, but you, you, you're cool. doing it, man. You're doing it. It's cool. I I, I work amongst giants, and I want to say that Miles Morales was created by Brian Michael Bendis, but I might be wrong, and he's not black. But that's the comic stuff. But I, it doesn't matter because black people have contributed to the propagation of this character and, and the, developing these stories right. and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Even like the second movie, Joaquin Dos Santos, Justin, I can't remember Justin's last name, forgive me, Justin. You know, one was white, one is Latino. You know, but Miles is, is, is he has two different cultures that he's a part of as well. Um, and so, you know, but they're amazing. And then you have amazing storyboard artists that were working on that project as well. They have their own unique takes and stuff like that. The homie Winton, you had Spencer Wan, you know, these guys are these are amazing talents as well. And you know, when I redesigned that Miles thing, it was like very polarizing. But the Cats at Insomniac games, 
all the art community really lo- they loved it, but they really dug it too. And so they surprised me by putting it in the game. So I, I was happy. It was it was a cool thing, you know. Yeah. It was a dope thing. So Chase, we know you've done cool shit, mm. right? And we're super proud of you. Thank you. We always love to talk about the struggles and, mm. and you know, because it doesn't success doesn't come without those. Of course. So tell me that story, that memory, that profound moment when you just like fucking failed. Mm. <clears throat> I've had a couple things, couple hiccups. Like, I mean, I never even got fired from a job. An art job. I got fired from Pizza Hut. I never got. <laughs> oh I shit! Got what was wrong with your Pizza, pizza suit? And uh, it was a it's a whole story. I don't, know, so <laughs> I don't want to say that on camera. But the um and the Warner Brothers. So I was working in their DTV department. That was the first time I ever lost a job. You like digital? D- no, uh, uh, direct to video. Oh, got it. So like I worked on four movies with them. On the last one, which was like Death of Superman Part One, I was struggling trying to acclimate to the Warner Brothers way of doing things in terms of their, not their staging, but like how reserved they were in certain instances and stuff like that and as, in regards of state, like, yeah, and cinematography and stuff, as well as understanding what the directors look for. And I worked under an amazing director, Sam Liu. Sam Liu is a, is, taught me a whole bunch of stuff about storytelling during the year that I was there. And um, yeah, I remember getting called into the office because I, I was late on my boards. I was only late on my boards twice and they were one, it was every other movie. <laughs> is, that, is that not a lot? No. I no, mean, no. It, it's not a lot. It was only one, yeah. on, oh, okay. only on only on my cleans too, like not even on the roughs. Got it. I was late twice by like a couple days, mm. not like a long time, you yeah. know, like a couple days. I didn't finish one of my sequences. It was a little bit too much for me and at that time I really struggled with um, staging big action sequences that had a lot of people in them moving simultaneously. And this was a crazy scene. It was like Aquaman rides up on dolphins with the Green Lantern. Cyborg is in the tower. There's a yacht, a, a cruise ship that's falling over and they use whales and waves and the Green Lantern ring to keep this thing from capsizing. And that was only one of my sequences. But my other ones, though, I, I, I killed those. I barely had any notes on them. And I was going through a, a breakup at the time and they, and they were like, you know what? We're downsizing one of the teams. So me and the homie, Chris Copeland, who's amazing. He's directing a feature at DreamWorks right now. You know, We both walked outside and I was like, yo, I just got let go. And he was like, I just got let go. And I was oh, like, no. oh, shit. <laughs> and um, They didn't like how you drew the cruise ship, huh? That was the Yeah, problem. well, I didn't finish it. <laughs> yeah, we're just like, so it, it was still rough. So, Jesus, you know, yeah, yeah but- the best part about that was, I remember Phil Barassa walked outside. It's a legend too, and Phil was like, "Yo, man, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna bounce back. This is cool." But I sounded the horn like Paul Revere, and I had a promotion and a raise. That was on Friday. I started on Puss in Boots at DreamWorks on Monday, with the as, as a um, storyboard director. Like literally over 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 the weekend. Yeah, I took to, I took the weekend off and I went to another job and I had a pay raise. Wow. A how, how do you come back from that though? Like, like let's you, you hit a pivotal point. You're like, mm-hmm. this is like you said, this is the first time I failed an art. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, to me that that sounds kind of extreme. You it know? was. It, it was. It can set you back a little bit. So how do you? What's your mindset like? Like when you when you hit that? Like how do you come back? Um, how do you just keep in it? I mean, take away the the new job that you got the next Monday, mm-hmm. but like let's say you did That's it. Crazy. I mean, well, I, like I, responsibility and accountability is everything. So the very first thing I did was like assess how did I get there? Also to understand that like there are creative differences at times. And I think in, it, it helped teach me and tighten my game. It, my ego wasn't wrapped up in it. You know, I was just hurt. Yeah, in a sense of it, I was like, damn, I failed. It's the first time I ever failed in that capacity, but it didn't stifle me creatively. You got to get whooped. Like at some point, 100%. To, to, yeah. to, to you learn to more from the shit. losses, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, 100%. you learn more. Fast forward, man. I want to actually congratulate you. Like I said, I, I'm mm. a, we're both nerds. Mm-hmm. I want to congratulate <laughs> you on joining Marvel Studios. Oh, thank you. And thank you. taking on X Men '97. Mm-hmm. That's I'm dope. <laughs> hyped about that because I've seen. I still watch it. Mm-hmm. It's on Disney. It's on Disney. Yeah. I still rewatch it because mm-hmm. there's it's just a good show, mm-hmm. and now you get to be a part of that, you know. So how, how did you how did you manage that, and like uh, what's your what's your role there? 
Uh, so I'm an episodic director. Um, yeah, and so I've, and I've been on it for a while now, uh, almost two, two, two and a half years about. Two and a yeah. half years I've been on it already. This is around the time I met Jasper too. Mm. I decided to stop drinking and I was like, because I wanted to improve. Yeah. I was like, yo, I really want to get better at my job. I really want to not have to deal with anything else. No distractions. I cut out everything, right? I still smoked weed for a little bit. but And for a while, I was like dealing with how alcohol is so associated with certain aspects of my life. So, you know, in, in animation, they kind of went hand in hand. You know what I mean? Those dopamine hits that I would get from being out, I didn't get those anymore. So I was like, and I, and I was going through things in my career where I was unhappy with the jobs I was getting. And uh, this is before Boondocks. This is right before Boondocks. And I was like, you know, what was what was I drawing the last time I was happy? When was the last time I was happy? That's what it turned into. I went home for the first time and stayed with my mom for like uh, two, three weeks for the first time of just going back to Charlotte, which I normally just go back and I'm back here. I was just like, well, I'm going to just go. I don't have a job right now. I'm going to go and kick it with my mom and stay with her and catch up with her over the holiday. And when I was there, I was like, when was the last time I was happy? I went all the way to fourth grade. Mm. And I was like, well, what was I doing in fourth grade? What was I drawing? Well, we had a legal cable. And I remember the, our neighbors that um, my mom split the cable with, like split with, just with a splitter. <laughs> yeah, anytime, they ever, anytime they ever watched a VCR, any, any tape, you know, whatever was on channel three, whatever the VCR was set to with yeah. three or four, I had, that's what I saw on, yeah. on channel three or four. Yeah. So they had three older brothers. I mean, three, she had three kids, Miss Sharon. And uh, Alan was the oldest brother and he had a bunch of anime on tape. And he watched Ninja Scroll. And so I, I was flipping through channels one day and I was like, this is insane. Yeah. You know, it was anybody that's seen Ninja Scroll, you ain't supposed to see that in fourth grade. <laughs> so yeah. it, I don't, I don't know it, the context, but when, sounds, you, when you watch it, sounds no, we'll, 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 we'll go watch it together after this. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. But um, um anyway, yeah, so I was like, okay, I was watching that X-Men the animated series is on, right? That was airing at the time. Yoshiaki Kawajiri is the director of Ninja Scroll. I've always wanted to see him and Yutaka Manawa, who was his art director, character designer, do a X-Men movie. Because his stuff, all, they, all the characters kind of feel like X-Men. When you watch Ninja Scroll, okay. you can see like the, the Devils of Kimon. They're like X-Men characters. Okay. So I was like, I want to see that. All the action animation people, they know we all have the same kind of influences. We've all seen the same kind of stuff. And they knew exactly what I was doing. So I was knocking those out one or two a week, right? I probably gained about 50,000 followers just off of just doing them in a series. And these were just portraits, like the ones you talked about yep. in your book. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not even going to spend time on this. Because I got I, I, during that time, I was working on Boondocks. So my peers, when they, get, when they started up X-Men, they started recruiting for it. Almost everybody they talked to, the line producer was saying, and a lot of people mentioned you, like you came highly recommended. Because people saw the potency of my X-Men stuff. Yeah. What they what they deemed to be potent anyway, you know. I don't want to say that for myself, but I knew that what my vision was is very clear. And because I came so highly recommended at this point, I just finished up on Sonic Two. I was directing another series, and I burned out. And so I was like, I'm gonna go home again and stay home three months. And I started teaching after that. And four months into teaching, I was like, Yo, this is great. My creative juices came back. I was at my mom's house just chilling on the couch and the line producer of X-Men just called my phone. He got my number from somebody. Damn. And he just offered me the job. What I loved about X-Men was like, it was really before its time. Like it, it, it really brought racism in, in, on screen as a cartoon to kids. Like, mm -hmm. you know, mutant versus humans. And I mean, it's an allegory. Perfect it's, it's, allegory for it's, that. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And, and like, and it was accepted. It was okay. And, mm -hmm. and I hope that it has that same impact. Um, in the new upcoming series, but well, you mean um, the, the source material is cool. You know, the the dope thing about it is, uh, as a director, I get to filter that through my lens as much as you can when you're working for a big company. But I get to filter that through my lens as a director. Like I, I get to reimagine some of these amazing scenes that Dude. writers wrote back in the '70s, '80s, '90s, or whatever. Can I wait? And then, and then I get to board that in a way that I see. Like, so I get to stage that in the way that I stay, I see that. I get to pace it the way I get to pace it. That's you know, I get to change this line of dialogue, do that, and, you know, so on and so forth. Because it's not it's not always a direct adaptation of a comic. It's like an adaptation. You yeah. know, you're, you're elevating in, in, in whatever way you can, yeah. you know. I might shoot you a text to uh, 
to, to be like, hey, can you do this? <laughs> but uh, yeah, just just to kind of wrap it up, man. Like that's Thank you. really really big, huge. Um, yeah. But yeah, just to wrap it up, I know that you've done so much from video games, from Marvel to DC, everything under the sun. Um, what's the only thing left is kind of your own your own IP, your own, you know, like yeah. your own characters, your own segue. message. It's a good segue. Yeah, no, for sure. So so what would you want to showcase to the world? Um, with your own story, with your own show, with your mm. own like anime, and what kind of message would that be? I like a lot of different themes. I, I I will say, the way I kind of have structured the first four or five IP that I've been developing on the side, they're all love letters to specific genres, right? So, I've got a, I don't want to call it. It's almost like a historical epic. I don't want to give too much of it away because I haven't talked about it yet, but when it takes place around the time of like the Trojan War, that kind of thing, right? Then I've got a Western that I'm working on right now that's called Die Laughing, which is really cool. It's like, um, yeah, I've, I've posted some stuff up for that. You know, I've been working on the pilot. I use that uh, as a teaching device as well. So I work on that on projectcity.tv. That's where I teach with a bunch of amazing people, amazing talent, industry top talent, you know, like, so I use that. So every Tuesday I work on that with my, the group of people that's in there. And then on Thursdays, I review their work that they turn in. But so I, I have Die Laughing, which is a cosmic horror Western with a, a black lead, which is really, just really dope. You know, it's just a love letter to a lot of the Kawajiri stuff that I grew up with. Um, you know, uh, Ninja Scroll, Vampire Hunter D, Bloodlust, you know, um, Wicked City, a lot of that stuff, like real, real, real dark kind of edgy stuff. Um, then I've got one that's more, um, this, this a sci-fi epic that's called uh, Rossum, yeah. Rossum Robot Hunter that I've been developing on the side as well, which is really dope. It's a love letter to like a lot of the Tatsunoko stuff, like, uh, and Kashern, you know, which was created in the sixties, uh, um, um, and a bunch of other stuff though, you know, it's a love letter. So if on the surface, it looks one way, but when you dive into it, it's like, oh, it's a cool remix. The same way I describe like the way Watanabe remixed Lupin characters mm. and then, and then incorporated like space captain Harlock and all that kind of stuff into one thing and, and made cowboy bebop, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, but it's, it is jazz. That's why jazz is the theme. You know what I mean? So yeah. a lot of my stuff, I think thematically the way I, I mismatch stuff together is very much like jazz. So, and then I've got a space opera that's called Sola, which is really going to be dope as well, which is like, I've always wanted to see black people in space. You know? <laughs> so that, we man. need to see more, more black people in space and more black people in sci-fi leads and stuff like that as well. So those are, that's the way I kind of structure it. It's like, what, what do I feel as if I don't get this, a chance to see myself in and I feel underrepresented in, you know, yeah. in terms of the leads, you know? The stuff I've always been influenced by were... The, like filmmakers and and the 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 animation giants that I've always looked up to, they were influenced by cinema. They weren't influenced by other anime. They were mm. making things. They were forty and fifty in the eighties and the nineties making this stuff. Animation is just a medium. That's yeah. the way I think about it. You know, I'm a filmmaker. I'm not trying to make cartoons per se. I'm trying to make something that actually speaks to you, where you get to actually you you you. you I'm not saying that the cartoons don't. You know, I don't want to say that that way, but. The stuff I make, you know, I explore a lot of serious themes, but I, I, I stage it realistically, you know, so, yeah. yeah. And I think it's incredible that you are willing to kind of go almost against the grain, right? Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of, at least the animators I know, like mm -hmm. that I've met and cause my sister went to Cal Arts, mm -hmm. right? And like, I met them, they kind of follow the grain, mm -hmm. right? This is what Disney has always done. This mm -hmm. is what DreamWorks has always done. But mm -hmm. for you, yeah, exactly, it's safe. But for you, you're going towards what people fear to do, mm -hmm. or you're willing to make your own mark. And that's really what I think what David said about you, and you're literally unapologetically you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such something that I, I remember from the day that I met you mm -hmm. till everything that you've done to this day has just resonated with me. And I, I always look I appreciate up to that, it. Man. Yeah, I always look up to you because yeah. I'm like, damn, like, had I been more like in my own footing, mm -hmm. going like, I could do this shit. Mm -hmm. I don't <laughs> care if I suck at it but I'm going to do it and I'm going to follow through that mm -hmm. type of work ethic and that thought process. I think that's something that everyone should carry. And it's just so like badass yeah. that you do that. I Thank you. I just always remember one thing that LaShawn told me. He was like, the difference in this town 
is and, and why people get the jobs and the opportunities that they get when you're always wondering like how that person get that job you know how this stuff keep getting made is because the people that get chosen to do that stuff they get chosen because they finish things Mm, I like that. It's not always because it's the best. It's because that's, they can finish it. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, on that note too, I think that's the perfect time, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Chase, let us know when this IP comes out. Let us get the demo, the preview before, it, sure. come, before it hits Netflix. Because if it, if you don't, it'll be a little hurt. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's hurt. cool. I don't know where I'm going to take it yet. You know, <laughs> no, like, but we, I don't we know where I'm going to take it. it. Yeah, we hope to see it, man. Of course, I, I thank think you guys. This let, has been awesome. Let's let's top you off. We got the we got we got another course for you. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so, speaking about finishing things, mm. we always finish thing here at Rosalind with the final bite. It's always something incredibly decadent, super tasty. I like this already. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I this promise you, you know, Chase starts with a C. Caviar starts with a C. We're gonna have Ooh. some of that tonight as well. So I'll be right back. Caviar? I'm gonna prepare that. I like everything. <laughs> let's go. Yeah. All right, I'll be right back. Yeah. I promise you caviar too. So shout out to our oh. friends over at Astria Caviar for sending this over. Nice. This their Kaluga hybrid. What we have right here, uh, Chase, for the final bite, again, the most decadent everything. We've got Thai water prawns mm -hmm. imported overnight from Thailand. Mm -hmm. So they're fresh, never frozen. They're known for their beautiful golden guts. Mm -hmm. So like it's just super flavorful and juicy, yep. tender. You got two sauces. You got our spicy tomato, heirloom tomato jam. It's got a little bit of sweetness, a little spice from Thai chilies. The right-hand side, though, or the white sauce is going to be our yuzu tzatziki sauce. Mm. So it's a little fresher. Mm -hmm. It's designed to bring all that flavor and the creaminess together mm -hmm. while contrasting it with the shrimp. Ooh. Grab the head. The, the, the body should fall right off. Oh, yeah, it did. I have two tails for you, so feel free to eat just the wow. tail first. I got the caviar on here, so I'm just going to go for it. Yeah, let's go. Let me, oh let me know God. what you think. This is insane. Mmm. You gotta eat it with the sauces. That's where all the flavor is. Ooh, it's got a little spice on that. That Thai chili like coming that. in. Yeah, I like that though. It's not yeah. it's not too much. I'm gonna put it right in front of the camera. We have that beautiful caviar. I'm gonna just shove it right in the head and I want you to suck on it, okay? I know that sounds suggestive. <laughs> we did that earlier. I like that you just keep doubling down yeah. on it though. I don't, I don't even know what's doing it. There you go. That's mm. where all the good guts are. You don't yeah. gotta say the instructions, mm. okay? <laughs> I heard it. Right I'm sure this is intentional now. Hell yeah. Cooked perfectly too. Holy shit. I wish you could the all try are, this. Look at that. Those prawns are so big. Well, they are Thai water prawns. Those are the same ones that you get on the street in Thailand, in Bangkok. But we're very blessed because of our relationship with Lux Seafood. We're able to get these bad boys. Mmm. So much umami. I wish you all could see Heidi's face right now. The level of enjoyment. You can. <laughs> you actually right can. There. Ooh. Oh my God, dude. Which has Continue enjoying your 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 dish. I was gonna say, don't ask me shit right <laughs> now. <laughs> that is the last course, unfortunately. But uh, I just want to thank you for spending your, your your evening with us and and just being a joy. Like your story mm. was dope. <laughs> but yeah, good luck with everything. Let us know when you drop your uh, your IPs. I'm I'm super like excited to hear about and watch all of them when they come yeah. out. This is, has been another episode of the Durian Pod. My name is David, and I'm Jasper. And uh, signing off behind the camera, we have our Heidi. Hello. Who's enjoying those prawns. <laughs> and uh, see you on the next episode. Peace. Peace, guys. If you guys enjoyed that episode of The Durian Pod, make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. You can find us on all platforms where you normally listen to your podcasts. See you there. <laughs>